This morning, it's a pleasure to welcome Rabbi Trek Reef to our pulpit. Trek is a rabbi and is connected to Unitarian Universalism and to many different spiritual journeys. He arrives here this morning from Bilbrica, Mass, and he, tra and he regularly travels all over New England from the Hillel Center in Boston to Star Island to share his stories and his spiritual teachings. Welcome, Trek. We're glad to share this part of the journey with you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our opening words this morning come from two sources, To the Four Directions by Joan Goodwin and Good Sense by Margaret Fuller. I invite you into a spirit of worship and celebration. The spirit of the east, spirit of air, of morning and springtime, be with us as the sun rises. In times of beginning, times of planting, inspire us with the fresh breath of courage as we go forth into new adventures. Spirit of the south, spirit of fire, of noontime and summer, be with us through the heat of the day and help us to be ever growing. Warm us with strength and energy for the work that awaits. Spirit of the west, spirit of water, of evening and autumn, be with us as the sun sets and help us to enjoy a rich harvest. Flow through us with a cooling, healing quietness and bring us peace. Spirit of the North, Spirit of Earth, of nighttime and winter, be with us in the darkness, in the time of gestation. Ground us in the wisdom of the changing seasons as we celebrate the spiraling journey of our lives. Margaret Fuller. All around us lies what we neither understand nor use. Our capacities, our instincts for this, our present sphere, are but half developed. Let us confine ourselves to that till the lesson be learned. Let us be completely natural before we trouble ourselves with the supernatural. I never see any of these things, but I long to get away and lie under a green tree and just let the wind blow on me. There is marvel and charm enough in that for me. I invite you to join in the chalice lighting. You can find it in the hymnals. It's number 362. has uh, three stories and a, uh, a short homily. The first story comes from uh, the life of Henry David Thoreau. 
Shortly before he left Walden Pond in 1846, Henry David Thoreau, who many of us here know and some of us now know, was a noted leader of the Transcendentalist movement, made a failed bid to reach the summit of Mount Katahdin in Maine. It's the highest peak in the state. He and two friends made their way to its base by canoe on the Penobscot, the west branch of the Penobscot River, guided by an old native Penobscot man by the name of Louis Neptune. He advised Thoreau to leave a bottle of rum at the top of the mountain to appease the mountain bird spirit, Kamola. On their climb, Thoreau and his companions followed moose trails and scrambled cross country. In one harrowing instance, while crawling over the flattened tops of the black spruce trees that had grown up between the mountain's massive boulders, Thoreau looked down to find that below him in the crevices lay the sleeping forms of black bears. Certainly the most treacherous and porous country I have ever traveled, he widely observed. The hiking party became lost in the fog, and they never made it to the summit. But on his descent, passing through an area called the Burnt Lands, these are lands that just burned because the forests burned. They still burn. Thoreau, who had spent most of his life in, <laughs> in Concord, <laughs> where a surplus of farms and fences had rendered the landscape tame and cheap, suddenly realized he had stumbled upon a really wild place. He found the burnt lands, as he said, savage, awful, and unspeakably beautiful. Here, he sensed, was the universal bedrock underlying the artifices of humankind. Recalling the experience, Thoreau himself wrote, That was the earth of which we have heard, made out of chaos and old night. Here was no man's garden, but the unhandled globe. It was not lawn, nor pasture, nor mead, or woodland, nor arable, nor wasteland. Humans were not to be so associated with it. It was matter, vast, terrific. Rocks, trees, wind on our cheeks, the solid earth, the actual world, the common sense, contact, contact. We walked over it with a certain awe, he said, stopping from time to time to pick the blueberries which grew there and had a smart and spicy taste to him. What is it to be admitted to a museum, he writes, to see a myriad of particular things compared with being shown some star's surface, some hard matter in its home? <clears throat> Second story, Benton Mackay's vision. How many people have heard of Benton Mackay? Excellent. <laughs> If you're lucky enough to have walked part or all of the Appalachian Trail, you've walked in the vision of one person that came to fruition. Benton Mackay conceived of the idea of a continuously marked trail along the crest of the Appalachian Mountains. Mackay wrote about this vision in an article that appeared in a magazine, an engineering magazine, uh, an architectural magazine in 1921. The first section of the trail was finished and constructed in Harriman State Park in New York. This was in 1922. The final section was added in Maine, including having been inspired by Henry David Thoreau's The Maine Woods, uh, making Katahdin the northern terminus in 1937. Benton Mackay grew up in Shirley Center, Massachusetts, reading the work of American naturalists and transcendentalist poets like Fuller and Emerson and Thoreau. And taking long walks in the mountains of Massachusetts and Vermont. A Unitarian, he was married to suffragette Betty Stubbs, a Universalist. Mackay wrote that the idea for the IT, AT was born one day when he was sitting in a treetop high at the summit of Stratton Mountain in Vermont. But after graduating from Harvard, he eventually went to work in the new U.S. Forest Service. And he began to try to figure out 
how he could, as a profound thinker, advocate for the wilderness in this lower end job. So he turned his attention to creating a discipline that later became known as regional planning. His initial 1921 project in regional planning, as he called it, was a proposal for a network of camps and communities in the mountains. They would be connected by a trail that would go through the highest points of all of the Appalachian Mountains. He called it the Appalachian Trail. Originally to start in Alabama and then end in, May, in, in uh, Mount Washington with a possible connection to Katahdin. Well, his vision was not exactly done the way he wanted it to be. Mackay was convinced that the pace of urban and industrial life along the East Coast was harmful to people. Living in big cities and living in, in communities where we don't have access to nature, he felt, was a denigration of society. It made us feel bad because we weren't being connected to the natural world. He envisioned that the AT as a path interspersed with planned wilderness communities could be a place where people could renew themselves and even go to live. The idea never gained much traction, but the notion of that 1,000-mile footpath, which is now 2,200 miles, fired the imaginations of hikers and outdoors people from Maine to Georgia. Inspired by him, they began building trails and trying to connect all of them. Perhaps love is like a resting place, a shelter from the storm. It exists to give you comfort, it is there to keep you warm. And in those times of trouble, when you are most alone, the memory of love will bring you home. Perhaps love is like a window, perhaps an open door. It invites you to come closer, it wants to show you more. And even if you lose yourself and don't know what to do, the memory of love will bring you Oh, love to some is like a cloud, to some as strong as steel. For some a way of living, for some a way to feel. And some say love is holding on, and some say letting go. And some say love is everything, some say they don't. Perhaps love is like the ocean, full of conflict, full of pain. Like a fire when it's cold outside, thunder when it rains. If I should live forever, and all my dreams come true, my memories of love will be of you. And some say love is holding on, and some say letting go. And some say love is everything, some say they don't know. Perhaps love is like the ocean, full of conflict, full of pain. Like a fire when it's cold outside, thunder when it rains. If I should live forever, and all my dreams come true, my memories of love will be of you. The story is a little bit longer, because it's a, a deeper story. For me, it, it touches me really deeply. Grandma Gatewood's Walk. 
Has anyone heard of Emma Gatewood? In May of 1955, when 67-year-old great-grandmother Emma Rowena Gatewood told her children that she was going for a hike in the woods, she left out a few important details, like the fact that she was heading 470 miles from her Ohio hometown to Mount Oglethorpe, Georgia, and the fact that this hike was the 2,000 plus mile Appalachian Trail. And Gatewood's intention was to become the first woman to solo through hike the entire thing. Born in 1887 in a 2,000 person community in Mercerville, Ohio, Gatewood lived a life tied to the woods. Her childhood was defined by physical labor. Growing up on a farm, everyone worked. Little kids, big kids, even the folks who were uh, in their 80s and uh, reading her life story, I'm impressed with the hard life that she had. At age 19, she married Percy Gatewood, who unfortunately did not treat her very well. She wrote, a walk in the woods behind her home often served as the only respite during the tri most trying of times in her life. After 33 years together in 1940, Gatewood managed to get a divorce, almost unheard of at the time, and raised the last of her 11 children on her own. At some point in the 1950s, with all her children grown and out of the house, Gatewood was reading a 1949 National Geographic oh. article about Pearl Schaefer, the first man to through hike the AT. As Gatewood's daughter Rowena would later retell the tale, her mother finished the piece and thought to herself, thought to herself, well, if those men can do it, I can do it too. A few women came before Gatewood on the AT, but she was the first to successfully hike the entire trail on her own. In 39, Mary Kilpatrick, along with her husband, completed the trail in sections. And in 52, Mildred Norman Ryder, who we probably know as Peace Pilgrim, became the first woman to through hike the AT with a companion. By the time Gatewood set out on her trek, only two more hikers, both men, had been added to the list of successful solo through hikers, Jean Espy and Chester, a very long name I cannot pronounce. <laughs> Gatewood had attempted the AT once before, 1953. She wrote, this is an utter failure. She began at the north end of the trail, in Maine, on Katahdin. She said her troubles began right away. I got lost right off the bat, she wrote. I was looking for water. I took a side trail down to the small lake. The water looked so nice. I decided to take a bath. When I came out, I broke my glasses. I repaired my glasses with some tape, but then I forgot which way I had come from. So I followed a trail that eventually peered out into thick bushes and vines. Remembering an old rowboat back on the trail, she went that way, <laughs> figuring she could take refuge under it if need be. She set fire signals, uh, signal fires to alert search planes, but finally decided, I'm just going to walk out. She was out of food, and the black flies were torturing her. She started trying to find her way back. She bushwhacked. After three days and two nights, she came upon four rangers looking for her. They told her, go home, Grandma. Two years later, Gabe would try it again. This time, she started from the south because she wanted to avoid the rangers who might recognize her. <laughs> she carried with her a homemade denim bag stuffed with a blanket, a plastic shower sheet, a cup, a canteen, a baby bottle for water, a small pot, a spoon, a Swiss Army knife, a first aid kit, pins, flashlight, a piece of rope, a raincoat, a warm coat, a change of clothes, and Ked's tennis sneakers. Which she hiked in, by the way, they are on display at a museum in Damascus, Virginia. She relied on the kindness of strangers who lived in the homes along the trail for food and shelter. At this point, the shelters along the trail had become 
dilapidated and were in serious need of repair. She spent many nights on picnic benches rather than in the shelters because they were so dangerous. While on the trail, Gatewood subsisted on raisins, nuts, some chicken, bullion cubes, and other foods that could be eaten up cold. Word of a grandmother hiking the trail spread pretty quickly. And by the time Gatewood had made it to Virginia, which is only a three, about 300 miles um, from, uh, well, in her case, it would have been about 400. Old Lothorpe added an extra 100 or so at the time. Now it starts at Springer Mountain. But by the time she got to Virginia, <laughs> The press had already found out about her. Once she got to Maine, the rangers she knew from two years ago helped to row her across the streams. The day before climbing Mount Katahdin to complete her 1955 hike, she fell and broke her glasses again. <laughs> she bruised her face, and to top it all off, she sprained her ankle. She climbed Mount Katahdin anyway, on, as she writes, a cold and windy day that was just like Thoreau's. It took me a long time to get to the top, she wrote. When I signed my name in the register, I never felt so alone in my life. But it was good. Atop the Totten, she sang America the Beautiful. By the end of her hike, her feet were swollen two sizes bigger than normal. She had worn out several pairs of Ked's tennis sneakers. But on September 25th and 55, after five months in the wilderness, she accomplished her goal. She didn't just sit back and revel in her success, though. No. Two years later, Gatewood returned to through hike the trail again. This time so she could, as she said, enjoy it. <laughs> making her the first person to through hike the entire Appalachian Trail twice. In 1964, she hiked the entire trail for a third time, but this time in sections. She died in 1973 at the age of 85. Her life achievements on the trail left an indelible mark in a whole trail community. In fact, according to the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, the press from her through hike saved the Appalachian Trail. The press of her through hike also reached the ears, ears of the president. In 1965, President Lyndon Johnson gave what he entitled the Natural Beauty Message to Congress, which led to the 1968 passage of the National Trail System Act and the National Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, protecting both at the time the only two national scenic trails, the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail for future generations. In the years since, through hiking has become way more accessible and inclusive to women, thank thank <laughs> thankfully, but the ratio of men to on the AT is still far from equal. It is improving. In 2016, the year that I through hiked, women made up 29% of the hike through hikers on the AT. I wouldn't have known it was 29%. My entire hiking crew, except for one guy, was all women. The Appalachian Trail Conservancy says that it would never top more than 15% prior to 2016. There's something incredibly relatable about Emma's story, her biographer Ben Montgomery writes. If she can, you hear it and you think, if she can do it, then I can too. I know for a fact that she has inspired hundreds to head outdoors and test themselves against the earth. What greater legacy could she have left behind? In this shared journey that we are on, we make time for each other's stories, for the losses, <coughs> and the joy of the path. I invite you to come forward and share a part of your journey with your fellow travelers. <coughs> come and stand with me here at the piano so we can hear your story.
commentary is, last week I shared with you my concern for my friend's father, who had been involved in an accident. He succumbed to his injuries a few short hours after I spoke, and he's being laid to rest tomorrow. I would now ask your prayers for their family, the Jagettos. I'm Lori Sidian. I want to listen to Peter Yarrow sing last night. And I have to say I got extremely emotional at this concert. His messages about anti-bias, about living in a world without fears and danger, were, spoke to me as they've always spoken to me since he began his journey as Peter, Paul, and Mary and he sang Mary's, con Mary's song, Leaving on a Jet Plane, <coughs> and see Mary flying out there. And Peter's 80 years old, and he's, he's shaking, and um, it'll be sad to see him leave us at some point. But his daughter is a folk singer, and she's carrying on, which I didn't realize, so I was pretty inspired by that. Anyway, it's hard to think about his last song he sang, This Land is Your Land, but he started with the verse, the sign says, everyone can be in this land. All races, all religions, this land belongs to all of us. And then he sang another song, an anti-bias song from quite a long time ago. And in the end it was, who made him, it, the song was about who made America great. It was the immigrants who made America great. And the song kept saying, the immigrants, those among us, made America great again. Hmm. <laughs> 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 I'm Miss Holly, and my joy this morning is that on Friday evening I got to be in town hall with some of the most unbelievable middle and high school students in the area. They took total charge of leading a forum. They invited a lot of different um, officials and they really spoke truth to power and it was the most beautiful thing I've seen in a really long time. I got to go backstage and uh, chat with some of them afterward, and it was so wonderful to hear some of them. They were saying things like, well, since fourth grade, I knew I was going to go to Dartmouth, but then I had to switch to top. So, I mean, they just <laughs> the focused group, and apparently there's a group in Concord, a group of students in Concord, who have chartered a bus for them. And they're now trying to fill a bus of students to go to this event in Concord. And it's just, it was amazing. Hi, I'm Doug Flockhart. Eileen and I just returned a few days ago from the trip of a lifetime to New Zealand. I won't talk about the scenery. Look at the pictures online. Now I know what the term melting pot means. I was absolutely blown away to look at people's faces. I saw faces from Japan, from China, from the Philippines, from the north and south of India from Australia, some from Europe, a lot from Oceania. And then when I heard them speak, they didn't speak in those languages. They all had a Kiwi accent. They were all comfortable with each other. Like it was the most natural thing in the world for people who were so different. to do a very short meditation. I'd like to invite uh, those who are young in age or in the spirit to come up and meditate with LJ.
a second to sort of shake out your shoulders and legs a little bit. Get comfortable. You might feel the stick you may have been in an uncomfortable spot up until the second ago. You don't even know it's <laughs> Let's take a deep breath in together. find a spot in the room to focus on. I'd like to invite you to take a few deep breaths together before we begin. I'd like you to imagine spot in nature that calls to you. Some people are ocean people, and some are mountain summit people, and some are fields people, pond people, river people, forest people. Find the space that calls to you. Standing in that space, Turn toward the east in your mind's eye. Feel the breeze from the east, the spirit of air washing over you as you breathe it in. I you turn to the south. You feel the warmth of the sun coming down on us. Warming us, enlivening us, filling us with energy. And we turn gentle mist coming from the air, the spirit of water cleansing and refreshing and moving us. this place. Feel free to return here anytime in the next week or month or years. And we're ready to take one more deep breath. Release it. This is going to 
to sound a little strange, but I had a difficult time writing a homily for this morning. I wasn't quite sure what to share, <laughs> how much to share. There's so much. So I thought I'd start with a quote. René de a French spiritual Paris surrealist writer and poet once wrote, you cannot stay on the summit forever. You have to come down again. So why bother in the first place? <laughs> Just this. What is above knows what is below. But what is below does not know what is above. One climbs, one sees. One descends, one no longer sees, but one has seen. There is an art of conducting oneself in the lower regions by the memory of what we saw higher up. When one can no longer see, one can at least still know. In 1971, a man by the name of John Perry, who everyone called Paul, was his middle name, decided he was going to take a walk. He was 30 years old, and he flew down to Georgia and forgot a bunch of things, hitchhiked back to Massachusetts, and hitchhiked back to Georgia. At 30 years old, he completed a through-hike of the Appalachian Trail, a dream of his. That was my dad. In 2001, my, my father passed away. I was 16, and we were, we were preparing to do something. If you knew my childhood, there's at least one person in this room who knows a little bit about my teenage years. <laughs> but I was a, uh, a bit of a rebel and had trouble staying in school. I didn't like school very much. I felt like I was able to learn better outside of school, which is true, it turns out, but I uh, didn't give the teachers a very nice time, and that's not a really good thing for anybody to be doing. But at 16, I and my dad were convinced that we were going to do a hike on the AT together. We were going to start from Maine, because he had done it from, from Georgia. So we were going to start, and two weeks before we were to leave, he passed away. Fifteen years later, in 2016, I completed my own through hike of the Appalachian Trail. I was a year older than my dad was when he did it. The Appalachian Trail to me, Unitarian Universalists, Jews, Muslims, no, none of us really have a grand temple. There's a couple of religions that have like a grand temple. It's the temple of their religion. The Christian scientists have the mother church in Boston. So that's their grand, you know, the grand thing. In Judaism, we lost our temple 2,000 years ago, so we haven't had a grand one in a long time. But to me, my grand temple is the Appalachian Trail. In 1948, there was an outdoorsman from York County, Pennsylvania. He was a World War II veteran. His name was Earl Schaefer. Until 1948, Benton Mackay and others, Benton Mackay was still alive, and others had not envisioned that anyone who had worked on this trail were ever going to be so, well, I think one person in the Appalachian Trail Conference at the time said stupid as to hike the entire trail <laughs> in one season. But he did it. And he said it was because he needed to walk the war out of his system. And he walked it off, all right, and right into the history books, becoming the first documented person to do a complete through-hike of the EAT. Today, more than 3,000 people each year attempt the through-hike. Last year, it was actually 3,600 attempted a through-hike. This footpath, this Appalachian Trail, goes through 14 states, <coughs> through pasture and forest and mountain, through fields of grass, through dirt and rock and boulders. About one in four succeed, myself included, finishing in an average of about six months until took year 10.
thing is, those 3,000 people only account for a small portion. In reality, Benton Mackay's vision is more reality in his original form than he realizes. As of 2007, which is the last time these statistics were taken, 2.5 million people annually hike some portion of the Appalachian Trail. It is the most hiked trail in the world. Now, that being said, I should, I should re rephrase that. It is the most hiked footpath in the world. Many trails also allow equestrians and, and bicycles, so when you include that, there are other trails that are far more used. But as footpaths go. But that was before the book and the movie versions of Wild and A Walk in the Woods came out. So I'm imagining that that 2.5 million might be a lot higher than it was in 2007. So as I mentioned earlier, Benton Mackay thinks, hey, I'm gonna, I have this great idea. I'm going to build this trail over the tops of all the mountains from Alabama to, to, uh, to, to New Hampshire, and maybe we'll push it into Maine. Wow. Just to, I just think about this. What, what was in the minds of the architects in Europe? in the Middle East when they built their grand temples. The spirit behind it, the love and devotion to this idea, these ideals. These are values, value systems of the past that I don't necessarily subscribe to anymore. But that isn't to say that they in their time didn't have this passion, this desire to connect with something. And for them, they were these buildings. But the American experience was shaped by the transcendentalists. It was shaped by our own writers. And so here, our value systems changed. We didn't see, the, I mean, thinking about Thoreau, we saw these savage and wild burnt lands that were awful and yet beautiful. This is when we began to change our attitudes towards the wilderness. It wasn't something to be conquered. It was something to be in fellowship with. So in 21, when Benjamin Cairo, I am I'm putting this together, he wrote the model, the motto, a footpath for those who should seek fellowship in the wilderness. So the trail was finished in 37. But, as I had mentioned in Grandma Gatewood's story, the trail was dilapidated. The shelters were, were falling down all over the place. The National Trail System Act of 1968 changed all of that 50 years ago. It put all long distance trails under the guise of federal jurisdiction and protection. It named the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail as the first two official national scenic trails. Since then, another nine national scenic trails have been added along with 19 National Historic Trails. Together, and this is astounding, and I haven't hiked all of them yet, but it's on my list. These 30 trails cover 55,000 miles in 49 states. Indiana is the only outlier. Passing through wild, rural, suburban, and urban areas. And then there's 1,200 National Recreation Trails. Some are only a mile. Some are even longer. And there's 2,000 rail trails, authorized by a 1983 amendment to the Act. <clears throat> so actually, when you get down to it, the entire National Trail System Act protects 103,000 miles of trails in all 50 states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and Guam. There's more miles of national trail than there are miles of the interstate highway system. <laughs> With individual trails having as few as one employee, the ATU only has 10, believe it or not, most of the upkeep on all these trails is by volunteers, people like us. The 
development and services on the trail are provided by these nonprofits. Some of you, I'm, I'm sure probably most of you have heard of the Appalachian Mountain Club. They exist mostly here in New Hampshire, and um, they have, they have a, a cabins all the way down to Delaware, Delaware Water Gap. These volunteers continue to protect the trail. What is it that inspires them? Not just the AT, but all of these trails. The latest National Scenic Trail that was added is the New England Trail. This is a trail that was formed in, 1999, in 2009, and it covers 250 miles from Connecticut into Massachusetts. And there's a proposal to push it all the way to Mount Manadnock in New Hampshire. What makes people want to protect these trails? What makes people want to even go into them? What is it about the journey that draws us out there? <coughs> I like to think that other people are as inspired as I am by the stories <coughs> I told earlier. That perhaps those are the reasons. Perhaps the reason is it's in your backyard. Perhaps the reason is you just love that one hour walk you take every week. When I was on the trail, there was a, so there's a strip map of the AT that you can buy that's about eight inches wide and four or five feet long. It's supposed to be waterproof. When I was in Hot Springs, North Carolina, I had been talking with a couple friends who I, I had made on the trail, and I said, uh, I said, look, we've gone two inches. <laughs> the friend, one of my friends looking over the map, she says, oi, we still have that far to go. <laughs> Another hiker across the table piped up and said, you know, if you want to go to Maine, you can get in the plane and drive there. It's not about getting there. It's about everything along the way. I like to think of the establishment of the National Trails System 50 years ago, and the movement to establish the National Park System, which oversees the National Trail System, 1916, allows us to satisfy that deep need within ourselves to journey. close with an excerpt from Ping Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Billard. Thomas Merton wrote, there is always a temptation to diddle around in the contemplative life, making itsy-bitsy statues. There is always an enormous temptation in all of life to diddle around in making itsy-bitsy friends and meals and journeys for itsy-bitsy years on end. It is so self-conscious, so apparently moral, simply to step aside from the gaps where the creeks and the winds pour down, saying, I never merited this grace, quite rightly, and then to sulk along the rest of your days on the edge of rage. I won't have it. The world is wilder than that in all directions, more dangerous and bitter more extravagant and bright. We are making hay when we should be making whoopee. We are raising tomatoes when we should be raising Cain or Lazarus. Go into the gaps if you can find them. They shift and vanish too. Stalk the gaps. Squeak into a gap in the soil. Turn and unlock more than a maple, a universe. This is how you spend an afternoon. This is how you spend tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon. Spend the afternoon on the journey. You can't take it with you. Each month we practice sharing our abundance. It's a great practice for remembering that we are all on a journey and they all will.
Good morning. Uh, I think most of us, but maybe a few don't know that once a month, the third Sunday of every month, we have a Give It Away Sunday where all cash and checks that are made out to that organization um, go to that organization for the month. And so uh, you know, with talk of adventures and love and, uh, and just volunteerism, we always get to hear some amazing group that's out in our community. And today we get to welcome Eileen Flockart from uh, the Board of Directors, I believe, uh, <laughs> on uh, the St. Vincent de Paul Society of the Community Assistance Center. And I believe you couldn't miss that dental van that's going to be open this after church so we can see what they're doing. Today. So, thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, those of you may be very familiar with uh, the food pantry, which is over on Lincoln Street, kind of diagonally across from Jerry's and the train station. We do a lot more than food pantry, as many of you know. Um, so many services that uh, we, we continually are amazed at how it's expanded. But what I'd like to talk to you about today is one of the new <coughs> services that we've um, been able to do because um, Exeter Hospital had a dental van that was kind of sitting and those of you who know Cleo Cassandet, um of course you went over and talked to them and said what are you doing with it and they said well I don't know he said can I have it <laughs> <laughs> and between the hospital and Families First and a lot of machinations in between, the dental van um, all of a sudden was parked outside our, our food pantry and we have now started to realize what that means for people. Um, and for those of you who don't have a sense of what it might be like to not have a dentist to go to, um, I wanted to kind of put a face onto that what that really means and we've had any number of people who've come in in a lot of pain but let's just take one instance say you're a single working mother with a couple of kids and you have a car that usually works and you you work hard at the job that you have and you've had some tooth problems but the last time you saw a dentist was just before your first child was born, and now he's nine. And all of a sudden, it's getting worse. But you take those over-the-counter meds, and it's kind of being held at bay. But it gets worse and worse. And it's getting so bad that you can't get to work, and you don't know what you're going to do. But somebody mentions that if you live in New Hampshire, there's this dental van over in Exeter and you could you could go there first come first serve and you arrange to take some time off of work you get your kids settled in uh, with a sitter and get them off to school and it opens at 8 so you get there you get there by 8 30 and there's already a line around and you're number six in line and you sit down in the lobby with others and you're not and you know you're going to get some help, but you're not having much fun because your mouth is just killing you. And uh, so finally they call you. The dentist sees you and naturally looks at the, the worst uh, of the situation. And frequently, for those who haven't been to the dentist in a long time, a really bad situation means an extraction, um, which can happen and frequently does. And then they urge you to come back and, and get some additional care so that you're, um, you're going to be better with this. And the thing that's amazing about Fridays at St. Vincent de Paul Community Assistance Center is that you see people come out of that dental van and their face is packed with gauze and it's all puffed out but they've got a grin on their face and they're looking at you and thanking you profusely and you realize that something 
and we might think is inconsequential, you just have to go to the dentist, is huge. And it's been resolved for them, at least for a while, and they know they can get care again. And so when I go to volunteer on Friday, I see these folks saying, oh, I'm sorry, are you okay? No, fine, no, this is great, thank you so much. And we're just like, boy, are we glad we can do that. Um, so that great big, huge, clunky looking van that got driven around the corner in the, in the sleety rain this morning um, is gonna be open for you to take a look at. And the first time I saw it, I was blown away. It's two huge, complete dental units, uh, chairs and all the equipment you need. Um, so it's just another amazing thing that we're able to do, and we can't do it without the amazing community support that we get. And we do. And FUSE has been part of that for year after year. You've provided volunteers and donations and board members and all of that. And so when we realize that, say, $100 of a donation can provide folks in need with about $2,000 worth of food that we can provide, or it can keep the little engine outside humming and keep it available for folks every Friday when they come and, and need that care. And it's available for, for everybody in New Hampshire, so we've had people drive from a great distance because they know it's there and we can help. So I'd like to thank you all for, for listening and whatever you can do to help would be just wonderful. If you were going to write a check, you can just write it out to SVDP for St. Vincent de Paul. But I'd encourage you to take a peek inside the van and see what it looks like and see what's there. Um, and thank you for listening. Receive, um, if, and I'll light some candles up at the front here. Uh, if anyone wishes to light a candle for a memory or a hope.